to ask you please to silence cell phones or anything that might go bleep or bleed during the presentation. We appreciate it, uh, especially your very near neighbors will appreciate it. <laughs> it's great to see so many folks here this evening. Um, other than that, uh, I just want to say that we're absolutely honored and delighted to have David Ives with us in conversation with John Rando. So I'm really going to hand it right over to them. Thank you. Too modest. He is one of the best directors in the country. So, you know. Gosh. And I want I, I want you to make use of John Rando while you have him here because when question and answers for, should be for both of us. And the the, the uh, David and I, you know, I I've, I've directed I I think close to sixteen different plays and and uh, musicals of David's. Maybe more. I've lost count because there's so many short plays that we did together and some on the air. Um, 
But we started work together in 1996, six, we think. Um, and I have to say, the, the best thing about working with David is just having a great friend. So um, in the theater, it's complicated. And to have somebody like David to just trust is really a really great thing for a director. And so anyway, that said, I'm going to I'm going to open because I have a few questions to give to David, and then we can to start our conversation. So I'm going to name some plays here that you've written, sir, um, and they're going to have a kind of unifying theme going on with them. Flea in her ear, the liar, school for lies. Metro Maniacs, The Heir Apparent, Venus and Fur. Ooh, so these are, are these adaptations or are they translations? Or you have a phrase that you like to use that I would love for you to talk to us about. Trans? Translatation. I, um, yes, that's what I would, I would, I would say these, um, these things are these things that I've been doing are not quite translations and not quite adaptations, so I call them translatations, because I give myself the liberty to do whatever the hell I want. Basically, um, all of these authors are dead, which is in my favor because they can't sue me or complain, and I don't have to give them any royalties. Um, but I, um, you know. I, I should think that if Shakespeare were alive today and you asked him what he did, he would probably say translatation because of his 37 more or less plays, 35 are adaptations of, of other people's work. And that may be why he didn't care if they were printed or not at the end of his life. I, I just think that he, he collected his money and wanted to go home and didn't care. But um, I... Part of the reason that that happened is chance, because uh, the Chicago Shakespeare Theater years ago asked me to adapt a flea in her ear, and, and I did, and I really enjoyed it, partly for the reason that I didn't have to work out the plot. <laughs> I, am, I am terrible at story. And, and, so, and because, you know, on stage, because a play is made of very few words, really, and is, and is a very simple plot. If somebody says yes, it's, it is an action. And so it has repercussions. And so in my mind, I'm constantly looking to see what the possible repercussions are because you don't want to go down the wrong avenue. And so I am saved that problem by Mark Twain writing Is He Dead? Or what's his name writing Venus and Fur? Um, Sakhar Masak. Yes, I couldn't remember it. Um, but um, so lately, a lot of my work has been of one kind or another um, by way of somebody else. Um, one of the uh, things that I can talk about in more detail later are these, I've been doing these adaptations, translatations of French classical um, comedy like The Heir Apparent and The Metromaniacs and The Liar, and that's a, that, that, has entered into the realm of verse, which is a, yet another avenue. But I, it's really, it, it takes the burden off of me because basically what I, um, what I do is I take something and I see what, for example, what Moliere would have done had he lived another 366 years <laughs> and how he would have fixed Tartuffe, you know? So I feel, I feel that I'm just doing the job that Moliere would have done <laughs> in my own voice. Um, and so the other thing that has contributed to that is, I don't know if you know the, the Encore series of musicals at City Center, but I did 33 of those. John directed maybe eight of those, something like that. And that was, and that was the, the, the world's best graduate course in playwriting because Basically, it's a form of literary ventriloquism where you take a musical from 1933 that was written by George and Ira Gershwin and Moss Hart, and you have to cut it down to two-thirds of its size, write new material, sometimes add in songs that were cut, 
And what that means is you have to think the way Moss Hart, Ira Gershwin, and George Gershwin were thinking in 1933. And so that kind of led the way to these <laughs> translatations in a certain way. Do you, do you, uh, you, you mentioned French classical comedy, which you did a lot of them. Do you, uh, for the, for the, I know, but <laughs> do you speak French? Do you read French? I mean, how, did, how does it, how do you actually do it? I'm sort of sorry you asked me that question, but <laughs> um, I, my, here's how the French thing happened. Um, my, the, the Chicago Shakespeare Theater asked me to do a flea in her ear in about 2000 or something. They were looking for a new translation of Fado's farce, and I did not want to do what playwrights most often do now, which is go to the drama bookshop, buy all the available translations, shuffle them together, and come up with a version. I wanted to take Fado's play and work from the original. What that, and my knowledge of French was based on a year and a half of French at Northwestern with a very beautiful French teacher and a girlfriend who lived in, in Paris whom I visited for three weeks. But that was sort of where I was with French. And so, but I, what I did was I got, a, I got a grammar book and I sort of went through the grammar book fast and I took Fado and I started reading him. And um, the nice thing about starting on Fado is that farce is fundamentally a machine. You know, there is, if, if there is anything extraneous in a farce, it shouldn't be there. And so it's very stripped down. And so my, my task in that was A, to relearn French, B, to take this play and, and figure out what the diction would be now. What the, what, how, would, how do these people speak? Do they speak like 1910 or do they speak like now? What age is this taking place in? So you, you have these questions. And so, but I had, once I did that, and it was very successful at, at Chicago, um, I somehow got this reputation as a French translator. <laughs> and, um, oh, I should tell you, there was one line, there was one place in a flea in her ear when I was, I was working on it, and I came to this place in the French where there was clearly meant to be a joke. Fado had, you know, you, could, you know that rhythm of it's, you know, it's speeding up and speeding up, and you know that there's a punchline coming. But I could not figure out what the punchline meant. So there was this French guy who lived across the hall from us. So I went across and I knocked on his door and I said, would you look at this and tell me what that means? And he said, I have no idea. And so that really gave me license to do whatever I wanted. Um, and so I suddenly had this reputation as a French translator without having deserved it. And a uh, classic stage company came to me with a Yasmina Reza play. She wrote art. Um, she, they brought me a Yasmina Reza play to, to translate. And I said, why not? So I did that. And unfortunately, or fortunately, Yasmina Reza is alive. And so I had to be very, very faithful to what I was doing. But I sort of had the French bug, even though, truth to tell, my German is much, much better than my French. And I would love to translate German plays, but German comedy is an oxymoron <laughs> in any language of the world. And you, may, you may sift German literature until you are blue in the face and you will not find a comedy. So I am stuck with, with the, the funny French. Anyway, so... Um, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. The funny French, I love it. But you see, you do the Fado, which is this, which is basically, uh, you know, dialogue. And which John directed, by the way, brilliantly in the, 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 the But then there's Corneille, and there's Regnard, there's these other playwrights that don't write in prose, but write in verse and then write in iambic pentameter, and sometimes even ridiculous <laughs> pentameter. <laughs> hexameter. Hexameter, yeah. yeah. Alexander. So how? how? How does that happen? How, did, how, do, you, how do you do that? Every, every good thing that's ever happened to me in life has happened by accident. You know, I have, I have found, this is my wisdom speaking now, I, I have found that anything I've ever wanted, I've never gotten, but all the great things of my life have come to me. And it was so with Flea and Herrier, it was so with Esmina Reza, and it was so with French 18th century comedy. Um, because what happened was, um, 
I now was firmly fixed as a French translator. I had done Yasmina Reza and Fidel, and I got, my agent called me up and said, Michael Kahn of the Shakespeare Theater of Washington would, wants to know if you would like to adapt The Liar which is by Corneille, which is a play I'd never heard of. And I, I, didn't, and I, I said, sure, you know, send it over. I, I also asked everybody I knew, and nobody knew about this play. So um, they sent it to me in French, because I was a French translator. <laughs> and, um, and so there's this play in, uh, from 1643, that I'd never heard of by, by you know, the great tragedian uh, Pierre Corneille, and it was wonderful. It was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever read, and I couldn't believe it was in French. You know, it was like, it was as if somebody had sent me A Midsummer Night's Dream, except it was in French, and nobody knew about it. And so I instantly said to uh, Michael Kahn, yes, I want to do this. Um, the thing is that that opened up this whole other world because French classical comedy, um, like French drama, until almost the middle of the 19th century, was in verse. And it was, it was in rhymed couplets of 12 syllables a line with a cejura in the middle of each line. And so the question I was faced with was, how do you do this? You know, I could take that play and turn it into prose, because it's a wonderful situation. If I did that, it would turn into a Seinfeld episode, you know, <laughs> which is to say nothing. It would turn into this flimsy little sitcom. And so I knew, but let me tell you what the, the liar is about. The liar is about this pathological young man, this young man arrives in Paris, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and he's a pathological liar. And no matter what you ask him about, he lies. And so he meets, he, meets, um, he meets a young woman, and he thinks her name is Clarice, but her name is Lucrece. That's the whole plot. <laughs> and, and what Corneille does in spinning this, because he keeps telling lies, be, the, what, what Corneille does in spinning this is create this world in which just about anything can happen because of this young man with these flights of incredible imagination and these page-long lies that he tells. So naturally, I thought this has to be in poetry because this is the story of an artist. It's basically a metaphor for someone who is out there on the high wire of language and not falling. And um, so knowing that, how do, you, how do you do it? Do you do it in couplets, which are the death of, of, you know, famous death of drama everywhere? So I decided, yes, I had to do it in couplets, and I am a pentameter. <laughs> and I would have to figure out, A, how to, how to write in iambic pentameter, and B, how to make it funny. And so I, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I've never had more fun than I had working on The Liar because I spent three months reading it every day, taking notes, <coughs> taking notes on how I would change the plot because I knew the plot was gonna need some, some su supporting. And at the same time, every morning, I read Shakespeare's sonnets out loud to myself to hear iambic pentameter and see how he did it and how he made iambic pentameter work. Then I started reading from the comedies like As You Like It and Twelfth Night to see how that, how he infused energy into iambic pentameter. And the nice thing about iambic pentameter, and the reason why it is used, why it was used for century after century, is that iambic pentameter is natural energy. It is like these quanta of thought and feeling coming at you in ten syllable bursts. Mm -hmm. And it and it does a lot of your thinking and feeling for you because it is telling you at what rhythm you can feel and, and when you slow down and when you stop. And so I realized I had been given this magical toolbox. I was this child in a new toy shop with iambic pentameter. So every day I would walk, I would take my daily walk after doing my work, and I would turn everything I saw into iambic pentameter. <laughs> I, and I would change lingerie ads on the sides of buses, and you know, I would, I would see a sentence running on the ticker tape of the news, and try to think, 
how does that shorten to 10 syllables? Because what's, I'll tell you what's good about 10 syllables. In 10 syllables, slightly contracts everything. It contracts feeling, it contracts thought, so that it concentrates. And when you give that to an audience, they have to listen a little more closely, and the actors have to, have to lean in a little more closely themselves. And so there is this greater interesting tension between the actors and the audience, because both are leaning in a little, a little further. And so um, I, fell in love, I, I fell in love with it. And so I've done four of those. One of them is coming in the spring to the Red Bull called The Metromaniacs, a play that nobody has ever heard of or, you know, hasn't been translated. I will tell you this about the author of The Metromaniacs. The author of The Metromaniacs was kept out of the French Academy in 1638, 1738, because he wrote an ode to the penis. <laughs> and the king would not allow him to be put into the, into the French Academy, so think about it. I mean, come see the play, it's not dirty at all. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna switch subjects a little bit, okay, for you. Okay, I'm gonna name some places, some theaters, you've started to name them, I'm gonna name four places. And then I just want you to talk about a writer's relationship to theaters. Um, the Shakespeare Theater in DC, classic stage company here in New York, primary stages, and begin with Manhattan Punchline. Wow, that's a nice list of theaters. That's that's a whole evening. That question is I know, a whole I know. evening's worth. Wow. Know, what what is it about those places and you? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Those those theaters fundamentally sum up my my life as a playwright in a funny way. I, you know, I I was a late bloomer. I, I suppose you would say because all in the timing happened. All in the timing was the play that sort of put me on the on on the on the roles of, of people. But um, that happened in 1992, and I'd been writing for a long time. All in the Time, it was a group of one-act plays, um, <coughs> almost all of which had been, had been done in New York. And here's what happened. I went to Yale Drama School. I got out of Yale Drama School. I spent some years. And um, my, I, 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 was, I made sort of the Woody, for a long time, I made the Woody Allen mistake. The Woody Allen mistake is that you have to be serious to be serious. And I was writing these intensely serious plays, you know. I was, I was putting Strindberg to shame. He looked like, you know, he looked like Mel Brooks compared to these plays, these plays I was writing. And, um, and so then, um, you know, I was in my 30s and um, what happened was, it's very simple, and, it's, and this is key to the life of artists. I got a job writing a movie, and for the first time in my whole writing life, I actually could pay my rent without having to temp type, work in a bookstore, wait, whatever you want. And so I suddenly had some money in the bank, and one night I sat down and I wrote this little play called Words, 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 about the three monkeys who are trying to write Hamlet and what they talk about while they're doing it. And um, I wrote it all in one night, and I sent it to this place called the Manhattan Punchline Theater, which had a, a, an annual one-act comedy festival. And they picked it up. And, um, and um, so I suddenly was writing comedy. I did, you know, it, was, it had sort of, as I say, come to me out of the blue. Um, and so every year after that, I, I, I would write a comedy or two for the Manhattan Punchline Theater, just a little one act. And I remember one of them, I wrote a play called Philip Glass Buys a Loaf of Bread, <laughs> which is five minutes and 38 seconds long, and is spoken in rhythm by four actors in sort of Robert Wilson style, you know. Um, it's kind of a parody of, of um, Einstein on the Beach, which John has directed brilliantly, the best version ever, anyway. So I wrote this play, tapping it out on my, on my tabletop late at night, you know, in rhythm for four actors. And I, and I was going to submit it to the Manhattan Punchline. 
And I thought, they are never going to take this one, you know? And so I walk into Steve Kaplan, who was the head of Manhattan Punchline, and I said, Steve, I've, I've, I've got a new comedy I want to submit. And he, and he looked at it and he said, Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread, I'll do it. <laughs> so that was how that one got in. But the great thing about Manhattan Punchline, and I'll have to, I'll have to, I have to squeeze all these in. The great thing about Manhattan Punchline, it was true theater. They had a budget that was in double digits, and they had a fax machine. That was it. And they gave you a stage and no money. And you, the thing is, when you have that, you have to be good. You know, it's like if you want to attract attention, if you want to keep your audience, you have no excuse. You can't blame the set for the costume. You have to actually be good. And so that is the best training in the world. And every year I put these up. All of the timing finally happened and went to primary stages in their 99 seat theater. It was turned down by every theater in New York except primary stages. Because they said an evening of one act plays will never sell, and it ran for two years at the John Houseman, um, moving from its 99 seat theater. Um, what would be next in that list? Um, you can now shift to, um, yeah. well, I just want to say that that, uh, just to underscore, New York off-Broadway, early 90s. It's off, been, off. Yeah, an, an incredible time for the theater, right? A very different world than what we live in right now, yeah. isn't it? Um, classic stage. Classic stage, oh my god. I hope, I hope all of you are subscribing, subscribers to Classic Stage. Um, I've done six plays in 10 years there, I think. Um, I did New Jerusalem, which was about Spinoza. I did Venus and Fur. I did The Liar, the, what did I do? School for Lies, Heir Apparent. Um, I forget what else. The thing about Classic Stage is, um, as John said, the 90s and off-off Broadway and those little 99-seat theaters are almost all gone now because nobody can afford to have them. Classic stage is a remnant of, of another age, which is off-Broadway. It's, two, it's 200 seats that, that can change to any shape. It has the best acoustics in the world. It's an old stable, and it's four stories high above the about the lighting room, and so if you do the classics there, if you do Shakespeare, if you do French classical comedy, the sound is so warm, and it's all natural sound. And so I love, you're also so present, because it's about, you know, it's about as big as this room, and so the actors are right there. And um, I don't know if some of you may have seen Venus and Fur down there, <laughs> But the design for Venus and Fur, which was by the brilliant John Lee Beatty, was so extraordinary and used that space. And here's what he did. He, uh, he put it three quarters around with the audience, three quarters around this thrust stage. But when you walked in into the theater, and you can't get out of classic stage once you're in it, you know, you aren't in the room. When you walked in, there was this three-story high box of silk. And there was no music. There was just this curtain hanging very high up, and, there, and you had no idea what was behind it. And, and um, the lights go down, there's a thunderclap, and the, the entire three, three floors of silk curtain drop to the floor, and suddenly there's this man there on a cell phone. And the immediacy of that was so electric that when it moved to Broadway, I thought that half of the play had gone away just because of the, the power of the opening was gone. And also, the power of being in a room that you can't get out of, where two people are involved in an erotic game. And that play was so sexy there, I cannot tell you. There was a scene, we also got some interesting audiences, needless to say. There was a scene, some of the, if, for those of you who saw it, where where um, the man, it's a man and a woman, and, and, the, and um, the woman says to the man, change my shoes, put on my, change my shoes. And um, that in the stage direction that I wrote, it said he changes her shoes. Walter Bobby, who directed that play brilliantly, 
said to me, oh, no, no, this is, this is going to be a moment. And so he, it, he didn't just change her shoes. Walter Bobby got the most amazing pair of dominatrix boots you've ever seen. And he had, he had the man kneel at her feet and change her into those boots. And he told the actor, take as long as you want. And so this was a silent scene five minutes long, in which he changed this, woman's, into, this woman into boots. And there was a night when they were doing it, sort of where I am now, and a man walked up the center aisle and stood right there <laughs> and watched them do it. And then he disappeared back into the crowd. <laughs> there was the night that four guys from dressed like Wall Street came and sat in the top row at the back. And the stage manager's report said, Four young men arrived in the audience tonight, and when the lights went down, they broke up brandy snifters and a bottle of brandy and drank for the entire play. <laughs> there was the woman who sat where you're sitting, and every time the woman in the play would sort of make a point, this woman would go, yes! <laughs> so it was, it was interesting down there. I mean, that is theater. That is real theater. And so, part, but part of it is the makeup of the room. You are not sitting, you know, a hundred feet back. You're not in a balcony. You are there. And those actors are so present. And, and so that's, that's part of what I love about classic stage. Um, yeah, and then, you know, I'm going to change my next question. We, we have one more theater to talk about, but the truth is, is that it's going to conclude this. I'm going to name two other places in this country that are important to you. And um, I want you to talk about them in reflection of your work, uh, how they inspired you, how, how, they, how they made you who you are, and how they made you write what you write. Um, one place is your hometown, Chicago. Um, and that includes the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. And the other place is San Francisco, and the city that you spent some time in. And um, you're, you uh, write about all these other worlds, and you write about French worlds, but, you, but these two places are very important to you. And I'm just curious, you know. That's another whole evening. That's a book. Um, yes, it is, I know. Um, San Francisco, start there. San Francisco. Um, I had one of the worst experiences of my life in San Francisco. Um, theatrical experiences, I should say. Um, I had, I went there for, I went there for a play called The Red Address and found that I had a director who was doing speed balls at night. And so his mind was not exactly on the play. Um, that was my, that was my baptism of fire in San Francisco. Um, it, I don't know, San Francisco is, is hard because it's a, it's a whole, um, you know, it's like, um, here's what I'll say about San Francisco. I, I have often found that the obvious is staring you in the face. No, the obvious is staring me in the face and I don't see it. And I moved to San Francisco and it's like the, the airplane door closed as I was moving there, and I thought, oh, I see, I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> but the airplane door had closed. And so that was sort of San Francisco, besides directors on speedballs and, and San Francisco, which is beautiful and empty. And so I have this, you know, I've always wanted to write a play about it, and I will sometime. Um, Chicago is where I came from. I came from the Polish Catholic steel mill part of Chicago, my, the apartment I grew up in, if you ever watched The Honeymooners, yeah. my apartment looked just like that. You know, and my dad was Ralph Cramden, my dad, you know. Um, the the, the, I'm sorry? The Polish version. The Polish version of, of The Honeymooners. And so that's where I came from. Um, needless to say, I'm a bit of a black sheep because nobody in that neighborhood could even spell theater, much less go to it. But um, it was... Um, it was, um, I, went to, I went to 
Catholic schools in Chicago, and um, the theater is littered with Catholics. I don't know if you know that. But um, think about it. You go, you go to a certain place, and you're quiet while people perform something in front of you, <laughs> which is somehow sacred in a, in, a, in a very bizarre way. And they say words which work upon you magically, and you come out somehow feeling better or not, or feeling purged, or feeling, feeling you've been through something. And so um, all of that, and also having, having priests who taught me English literature and how to write and how to read, because I was sort of the last end, I guess. I don't know if John, John would be part of this, but I was sort of the last end of humanistic education, you know where you had a set curriculum, there was a canon of things you were supposed to know about, and, and pr the priests in my school had authority because we trusted them and we believed that they wanted the best for us. And they were very hard on us and we loved them for it because they made us be better. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a line of Wendell Berry, the great American essayist, poet, farmer, you know, speaker, whatever. But Wendell Berry said something that I always think about the theater. He said, it is not from ourselves that we will learn to be better than we are. And I think that that is, I've always thought that's part of the job of the theater, is that you go to the theater to watch other human beings go through something, and presumably through these other people, through those actors, and all the people who worked on that, you will be, become somehow better than you are. And that may mean that you understand people better, that may mean that you appreciate language better, but somehow we need other people and that is the great socializing job of the theater. You know, I, I am firmly of the belief that um, if, if I hadn't gone into the theater, I would be living in a log cabin in Minnesota surrounded by guns and, you know, <laughs> Nazi memorabilia or something, because the theater saved me. Um, I was going to be a medievalist when I went into college, and somehow I ended up becoming a playwright. And, but the thing about the theater is that, and I, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but the, the, the theater and democracy came into the, into the world at the same time in the same place. Athens, 500 BC, those two things happened, and I've always thought that can't be an accident, because they're the same thing. Both of them involve people getting together and putting aside their differences to try to make something good. And when you, are, when you come into a production, when you walk into a room and you, you meet a director you don't know, you meet actors you don't know, you are putting everything aside and you are saying, let's concentrate on this and make it good, and everybody in the room is valuable. That's partly what's so great about the theater. That's why, if the government were smart, they would fund theater programs for every high school in the country because in theater, you are valuable. It doesn't matter if you're sewing on the buttons or taking the tickets, you are necessary to this great thing you're trying to put up. And so, um, I can't remember how I even got to that, through Chicago, through priests, through through a feeling of value for literature, and thank God there was this, I was, I was interested in Hamlet, as every 17-year-old was, and this priest who was my teacher said, do you want to do a scene from Hamlet? Find some guys and put it up, and he gave us the auditorium and let us put up a scene from Hamlet, and that is electric. I mean, the trust of that, you know, that he said, go ahead and do it, go with what you want, and um, so that, education, I suppose, was so intrinsic to, to what I do. Um, I also remember that I went up to that same priest after class one day and I said, Father, I've been, I've been reading The Wasteland and I have no idea what it means. And he said, good. <laughs> he said, nobody knows what it means, but you know what? I bet that you found things that were interesting in there, interesting images. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. So read it again. And so what better education is there than that, you know, of just opening you up? And so that, that's Chicago for me. Um, 
it was rich. It was a neighborhood full of rich, rich poor people. You know. Um, I, yeah, maybe I'm going to give one more. Yeah, we'll one more question. Before. Yeah, um, this is more of a comment, and then leading to maybe you talking a little bit about it. I want to talk about um, you know uh, we did uh, what I consider just one of a great time in my career. We did a, a play called Mere Mortals, which was sort of a follow up to All the Time, a collection of six one act plays, and uh, we did it off Broadway. And we were very successful, and and. Um, and I remember um, the producer, Jeffrey Richards, calling me uh, back then, because we didn't have the internet, calling me on the phone and reading to me late one night the, the review that Peter Marks wrote about the show. And, uh, and of course, it was really positive. And I remember um, highlight, it highlighted, um, not, uh, it highlighted the, the language, uh, which was such a pleasure to see and um, mentioning the brilliance of it um, and the kind of unbelievable dexterity and, and grace and uh, cleverness. But he also stressed that you understand that it's also about entertaining. Mm -hmm. That language can be both. Mm -hmm. can be both extremely brilliant and demanding of an audience demanding of its intelligence, mm -hmm. but it also has to entertain. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, I've always remembered that mm -hmm. about your work, because mm -hmm. it's, it's almost true in everything that I've worked with or that, I, that I've seen um, from, from Venus and Fur to Words, 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 to it's just a, to the stuff that we kind of at City Center on, of course. Mm -hmm. there, there's um, always a brilliance behind it. But at the same time, there's, I've got to make it really good. I've got to make it really funny. I've got to make it really entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, what, what, I guess I'm asking you as the, as the playwright, uh, 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 I'm asking you as the director saying, I'm so grateful <laughs> that you think that way because it, it helps. And maybe you can comment on that. Um, I, I think, well, I should, I should tell you that I was once, it may have been on that very play, John was directing some play of mine, and it just so happened that during the lunch hour, I wandered behind the, the, the table where, you know, the playwright sits next to the director and the stage manager, and it just so happened that during lunch, I walked behind John's script, and John's script was open, and I saw what he had marked in the margins, and basically down the right-hand side of the, of the script, it said, better joke better joke, better joke. And so, as an opening night gift for John for that particular play, I got an enormous rubber stamp that said better joke to, to save him the power. But that, that is by way of saying, um, I, 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 I'm with Bertolt Brecht, not, you know, communism, yes. And, but Bertolt Brecht once said, if a play isn't entertaining, it doesn't matter what else it is. And so that is kind of how I feel that, you know, um, you have to take out anything that doesn't belong. You have to take out characters who are, have overstayed their welcome. But I do, do not have a very exalted idea about playwrights, to, to tell you the truth. And this is in answer to your question. I. Um, Playwrights are well and good, but playwrights are servants of actors. Um, we would not be, you know, we owe them our lives and our livelihoods. And so I find that, you know, actors, are the, actors and a good director are the whetstone of a play. And you walk in and they make you better. You know, you listen to a good actor read a speech three times, and if he can't make it work, it's not the actor's fault, it's your fault. And you have to rethink that speech. And so everything, the great thing about plays is, is in the rewriting. It's not in the writing. It's not sitting in a room and putting something down. It's getting in a room with other people who make it better because they're bringing their talent to it. And nobody has better antenna than an actor or a director like John. You know, we, um, John and I, 
it is joyous because basically the way John directs, it, and there are, every director has his method, but John gets in a room and he infuses the room with positive energy so that everybody believes in, in what they're doing. And so when you do that, what, what needs to be skimmed away just comes, comes naturally. It's like John and I had an evening where we cut plays out of the whole evening. Yeah. And you know, yeah. and you come to that, but you come by trust. You have this, this relationship whereby you are thinking as one. And so I believe in, in plays being entertaining, but they are really this collective process. The great thing about theater, one of the fascinating things about theater, is that it's the only, it's the only art form which is a living organism, which is to say, there's a, there's a Darwinian aspect to a play. It's like an amoeba which collects things, and it changes, and it changes when it begins, it changes when an audience meets it, it changes every day as you come to it, because it's reacting to you. Those actors can hear you, and the energy in the room is partly your energy. And so it is, it is this, verbal object that gets wiser as it goes along. And there is no other art form that does that. A painting is finished, you know. Um, and so um, that's sort of my, my roundabout answer. To I want, just want to talk about it briefly, just as an example of what you're saying. Um, we recently did uh, uh, a play, a collection of plays called Lives of the Saints at Primary Stages. and. Um, there's a play that David wrote, it was a new play that we were adding to this group about um, a couple um, and uh, the, the, man, the man is uh, visiting his mother who is dying. Right. Um, and then the, doc, the scene opens with the doctor over the dead body, or the, the body and pronounces her dead. Um, and uh, he's quite upset, of course, and the, and then um, they, the doctor leaves the room, and so does the wife, and then he hears the mother talking to him. Um, and, but she's just been pronounced dead, and so the doctor comes back. And he, 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 the, the man freaks out. He's not sure if she's alive. He doesn't, he's hurt something, and then he comes back in the room. And, and from there, this kind of incredible uh, thing takes place. Anyway, what I'm trying to talk about is the process. Um, we, we, when David handed us, that is me, and the actors, the script, um, we were completely knocked out by it and excited by it. And as we went to work on it, midway through a very important rehearsal, probably our third or fourth rehearsal, where we're really on our feet, and um, David uh, suddenly put his hand up and said, wait, wait, I have to change this. I have, and having heard what we were doing, and you made a completely amazing change to that moment. I know. Do you remember? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. I'm like, I'm like, in which? What am I seeing? In which um, the uh, the 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 man starts to yell at the mother, un unleashing on her. Yet yeah, um, this whole section didn't exist um, before we walked into rehearsal. And I have to say, the actor uh, is a favorite of ours, Carson L. Rod. Maybe some of you know him or recognize, would recognize him from some of the plays that we've done together. But your relationship to, to actors is truly remarkable. And the trust that you have with certain actors to develop the work is what, what I find um, kind of freeing for us. Um, uh, because it helps the process. Well, the, I don't know if you remember, but the part of that doctor who pronounces the woman dead at the beginning, he had three lines at the beginning and two lines in the middle, and then we got Arnie Burton to play the doctor. If, you, if any of you saw the Inspector General, he was, in, he was just in the Inspector General, and he's one of the great comic actors in New York, and so he ended up re reading the doctor, and suddenly the doctor had pages of stuff. You know, he had a funny hat all of a sudden, you know, and um, and so all of that all of that changed. Arnie Burton was in a play that I wrote called Soap Opera, which is about 
the Maytag repairman oh. falling in love with a washing machine. <laughs> and, and Ernie Burton had this, and, and there was this, this, the first time we did it, which is 15 years ago, Ernie Burton had, was playing a bunch of small parts, and I, and I thought, he's got to have something better. And so he just recently reminded me that I'd left the room, and they, everybody heard this typewriter going in the room, and I came back in with this long speech of him as a madman. Who, who's, who's, uh, you know, who was, whose life was ruined by a washing machine and a long beard, a former lover of the, of the yeah, former Maytag repairman, and he gets sucked into the washing machine um, in the course of this. And so he just reminded me that I wrote that, you know, during rehearsal one day. But that's what it's like, you know, get in the theater, it's so much fun. <laughs> So with that, we have questions. Questions, questions. yes, anybody? Uh, speaking of fun, I enjoy your work very much. In fact, I have no idea how much I enjoyed it because I've been going to Hong Kong for years, and I didn't necessarily associate you with Hong Kong. Would you discuss the collaborative experience, how you pick the musicals, how you take some of the old chestnuts and make them relevant, and what happens when you add music yeah. to the mix of theater. I want to, I, I would, uh, our first collaboration at City Center Encores, uh, David uh, brought me there because uh, uh, I, was, I was directing Mere Mortals, this is 96, 7, whatever it was. And um, our first collaboration was Strike Up the Band, Gershwin, which is a fantastic, wonderful piece. But the interesting thing about that piece is it, it was written twice. It was written out of town. And the basic story is about a Swiss cheese factory <laughs> in Switzerland. And it got changed to, when it came to Broadway, to a Swiss chocolate factory. And David called me up and he, I had read the original, because that's what they do at Encores. They, they try to get the original orchestrations, they try to get the original scripts, from even if they were out of town, the out of town script. That's what they're interested in, kind of uh, architectural or, or, or archeologically excavating. And David called and said, Rando, uh, we gotta go with cheese. It's just funnier than chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so we went with cheese. We went with cheese. And uh, that process is really, David goes away and he tries to take these, and the great thing about Encores is that the, the basic rule is that three to four pages of dialogue and then there must be a song. Because it's essentially a concert, um, at least in the early days, and it still is weirdly, even though we do a lot more there than we did in the early days. Um, and so David had that rule and he stuck to it. And yeah, I came up with that rule. Yeah. And the, that rule ended up helping tremendously because um, y y we had to really take things out and only keep what was really good and really necessary to storytelling. And um, so David would do that first pass of cut, send it to me. I would say, oh, I really missed this, or oh, I missed that, or well, we don't need that. Or better joke. Better joke, <laughs> on occasion. And then it would go back and he would do some more work. We always miss characters. Sometimes they would combine characters. We did, um, uh, one of my favorites was the Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, um, which I, I had no idea was such a fun evening. Um, uh, you know, I'd only known the film and I didn't know the play, and, um, but, that, but David had this fantastic idea. If you looked at the original, it's a really sprawling script that's quite messy and really complicated and bounces back between uh, locations and, um, and knowing that we had limited scenery, limited props, you were able to just focus, especially the first half of the play, put it all on a boat, essentially. And it, um, so that's, that's what Encores does and what that, of course, allows us to do is give us more time in the songs, more time to dance, more time to really do the entertaining. <laughs> I would also say that, um, you know, I haven't done on course for a few, a few years. I, I stopped at 30, 33 of them just because I found um, I've been doing it for too long. You know, I, I am a firm believer in only doing 
what's fun. And you know, when it's not fun anymore, it's not fun for anybody else either. But the great thing about encores in the old days, which is no longer true, but when we were doing Strike Up the Band, you read, you read it around a table on Monday, and you had to have it up by Thursday, and you had really, what, five days. You had about five days to put up a show. But they, they've extended that now. The great thing about that is, it's just like the Manhattan Theater, Manhattan Punchline Principle. When you have five days to put up a show, you have to be good. And that means you have to go with your first idea, and your first idea has to be good. And so everybody is at the top of their game. Because the actors are at the top of their game because they know they've got five days to try to make this good. And so the concentration in the room was fantastic, and the fun. The fun was just so much. Other questions? Yes, over here. Um, am I ever surprised by what audiences find funny? Um, absolutely. Actually, um, case in point is Venus and Fur. Um, you know, Venus and Fur was an, was an odd play because I almost inevitably know by the time of first preview what I have in hand, you know, what, what this show is. With Venus and Fur, Walter Bobby and I had no idea how the audience was going to take to, take to this play or take this play. And um, we were worried that people would laugh at it. We were worried that people would walk out. You know, we had all kinds of worries, which was not helped by the fact that at the first, at the dress rehearsal, John Lee Beatty, I don't know why he did this, but John Lee Beatty, the set designer, sat through the whole run through and he walked up to Walter and he said, I think you boys should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> and like, what? Well, what does that mean? And so I think he was just toying with our minds. But, but that was a show that had many more laughs than I ever expected it to, you know? And so that was part of the, um, part of the experience of it. That, um, so that, that was a show that totally surprised me about, um, about laughter. So yes, that was, any, yes, do you have something over here? Um, yeah, so all of the time I think it's actually part of the sort of high school and college theatrical canon now. I think everyone I know has done something from it. Um, I, I did Kelsey. Um, so, um, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on were, how do you, like the, the sort of risk taking of those plays has almost become cliche now that everyone's done one of them. Um, so I was wondering, as both a director and a playwright, how do you sort of instill kind of from an education standpoint almost like how do you make people comfortable with risk taking? How do you make people love the risk taking and be less afraid to do it? The um, all the time the Trotsky is a good example. Um, life uh, that the Trotsky it's a play in which it's a genius idea. It's a simple, straightforward idea. There's Trotsky, he's at his desk, desk in Koyakan, lights come up and he has an axe in his head, <laughs> and go, <laughs> and invent. And so this is what you're talking about, risk. It's like a magical, unbelievable risk. And David's variations on the death of Trotsky, so we have, and David has seven of them, and um, so you have, to, you have to go through each of them. And the risk is, of course, what is it? And um, if, if you read it, you can smell, as he described to you, the honeymooners, in the play itself. What a great idea to have Trotsky and his wife be Ralph and Alice. <laughs> like, it's so unthinkable. I think he says, bang, zoom to the moon, Mrs. Yeah. Trotsky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he does, he does. And so, um, uh, I believe that, I believe that, um, the, so I guess what, maybe what you're asking though about risk is really for the performer, a young performer, is that what you? I mean, for performers and actors and sort of everyone in the room, yeah, well, I mean, I, as a performer, the uh, commitment to the, if you, <coughs> the genius of the idea, right there, the kind of absurdity and brilliance at the same time, that should be a trigger to your inner life and to what you're going to do if you play that part. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh my God, to think that, to actually think that he can be talking, because it's true, it's the, the story goes that he lived a little bit with this axe in his head. That was the, that was the original idea. You know? <laughs> he, he lived a little bit. What did he say? Yeah, well, yeah that, was, that was how that play began. Um, 
variations on the death of Trotsky began because I was, I was reading the, the, the New York Times one morning over breakfast, and I was reading the story about Trotsky, and it mentioned, by the by, Trotsky was hit with a mountain climber's axe and lived 36 hours. And, and I thought, well, what do you do for 36 hours with a mountain climber's axe in your head? You know, what do you, fast food is obviously, you know, in, in order, in order. Um, but, you know, the way, but again, that, was, that, that play was like one of those weird gifts that, as I say, kind of are dropped in my lap because a friend called me up as I was reading this and I said, it was an actor, and I said, did you see the story about Trotsky? And we started laughing about it and, and thinking all the variations on what could happen. And it just so happened that that friend, Fred Sanders, was having a birthday. And so as a birthday gift, I wrote him this skit called Variations on the Death of Trotsky to remind him of our funny conversation that morning. And I gave it to him as a birthday gift, and he said, you know what? We should put this play up. And so they did it at the Manhattan Punchline. And he, you know, he, he, no, he didn't direct that one, but, um, but that's how that play came to be. But you know, when you say risk, I, I never, I love risk. You know, I, I, I firmly believe that if it's not new and if it's not risky, what, what is the point? If it's not an iambic pentameter and couplets, why do it, you know? And so I like, I think, I love to hand actors a little problem, you know? It's like, I wrote this play called The Universal Language, which is written in gibberish. It's like, how do you speak in gibberish? And, or how do, you, how do you play a monkey who is talking about Hamlet? And so there are these little acting problems in there that are, I suppose, what you would call risk, but what I would call fun. And so actors see these little, these little challenges, you know, and every one of those short plays has some risky challenge. We were in the middle of uh, previews, towards the end of previews, in a, um, on Lives of the Saints, a recent version of it two years ago, at Primary Stages, and we were rehearsing um, a play called Enigma Variations, which is um, basically uh, a woman goes to see uh, a doctor, a psychiatrist, but next to her is, her, her name is Bibi, and next to her is her shadow, or her doppelganger, Bibi. And then there's- She's named Bibi Doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the doctor has his doppelganger, the gangler. And, um, and uh, the actors, Carson was in this, Arnie Burton was in this, and others that we've worked with over the years. And um, we knew that we weren't quite there yet with it. And um, David did a pretty significant change and rewrite that was caused a lot of in interesting complications for actors who were just about to open a play and feeling a lot of nerves and wondering why the playwright and director were suddenly foisting these changes on them. And it wasn't easy to put them in because this language play was a poem and also a rhythm thing, and it's hard to remember. Um, so they were, we were busting our house in rehearsal for a couple of hours, and at one point, um, it, you, we, could, we could both sense that it was getting really, really good. We could see that it was getting sharper and smarter and, and kind of just musical and really interesting, um, even better than it had already been. Um, and David turned to me and said, you know, John, if it were easy, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> and I think that's a real clue to his work. It's never going to be easy. But that's not the point. Why do it? You know? Yes. Uh, do, do you, uh, in your head, you see certain, in terms of casting, do you think of certain characters, certain people when you're writing for certain characters? And also, following up, do you ever have a point of view when you're talking to a director who you'd like to see in a role? Um, do I think of certain people and do I ask for certain people? Um, yes, there is a, um, especially I would say with the French plays um, that I've been doing, part because, you know, when you write plays in rhymed couplets and iambic pentameter that are classically based, 
the acting pool you're talking about is about 12 people in this city, and six of them are not available. And so you have to, you have to, or when we're putting those plays up, and Michael Kahn has directed um, all four of the, all four of the, the, the ones that I have in couplets, there is, this, there is this group of repertory actors that has sort of conglomerated around those plays. And so by the time I was writing the third and fourth one, I was writing for Carson Elrod. I was writing for Amelia Pedlow or Tony Roach. There are these actors who just know how to do it. And um, we had to audition for, um, when we were doing The Liar at Plastic Stage here this, this past year, we had to audition for one part of a young woman. And we went through days and days and days of young women coming in, and they were good actors, but it's possible they weren't funny. It's possible they couldn't do verse. And so if they can't do both of those things and be right for the character, you know, you're, you're reducing and reducing. And then Ishmania Mendez walked in and she opened her mouth and she had it. You know, she had it in one 10 syllable line. You could just tell she was that character, she was funny and she spoke verse beautifully. And so, yes, I do, especially with those plays. And then, you know, auditioning is, um, these days is often a matter of asking people you know because you know that they would be right. Um, wouldn't you say? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, for David's plays, it's pretty clear right away in the audition process that an actor walks in, and a very talented actor, and they just either get it, get the language, get the use of the language, or they don't. And it's so clear, it's almost um, remarkable, actually. Other playwrights, other works, uh, it's... They don't, um, frankly, they just aren't as interesting with language as David can be. Um, and so the, that, the, that skill is not required. Um, so when you walk into the room for auditioning for a David Ives play, your language skill has to be way up there. Uh, do you work on lots of plays at once? You're clearly very prolific, and some plays suddenly, you know, come one morning when you've talked with an actor, but do you often work on more than one at once? Um, I, I have, actually, um, at certain times, partly because there were deadlines, and sometimes I, I have had to, but I don't mind working on two things, some, but I always, I can't work in the afternoon, but somehow that's always the dead time for me. And so I, work in, I can work in the morning on one project and then take my walk, think about what I did, take some notes, have supper, say hello to my beautiful wife, and then go back to work. I don't do that as much anymore just because I don't have the, that kind of energy I used to. But I'm, I'm working on, um, I've been working recently on a few things at the same time. It's like, I'm, I just finished a new play at the same time that I had to rewrite a movie for some producers. And so the question is, which is, how do you apportion your time? And so I would work on the play in the morning because that's the blast, and then at night, take a nap, wake up, and then, and then work on, on the movie. So, so I don't mind that. Um, yeah, it is possible, but there are people who, who won't. It's like Stephen Sondheim says that he will not work on two songs at the same time, much less two different projects. And so that's a, that's a totally different kind of, you know, everybody is, is, is really different. Um, any, anybody? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed that you could translate the, the Corneille and be able to, I mean, because that, that French too is not contemporary French. So how was it possible that you were able to do that with just French grammar three weeks with <laughs> <laughs> um, How was I able to translate these it's French plays? It's incredibly difficult. And she's asking about Corneille especially, but you know, interesting question in terms of language because um, it's actually easier to read 17th century um, French comedy than it is to read Yasmina Reza. Here's why, is that in French classical comedy, the vocabulary was actually very limited. 
And, um, and once you learn the equivalent of fire, desire, mood, spoon, you know, you're, you're well ahead of the game. But also, it's like, if you look at, if you look at Racine, um, who, you know, great French tragedian of 1660, let's say, the vocabulary of all of Racine's plays is 3,000 words, mm -hmm. which is not much. Shakespeare used a vocabulary of 27,000 words. And so you, you, that tells you everything right there, that once you, I learned all those 3,000 words, basically. <laughs> and, um, and so it's not, it's not really quite as demanding. You know, there are little grammar things, but the French language has not, the, the French Academy was set up to freeze the French language, and effectively it has. So that the French language has not significantly changed in grammar in 350 years, which may be why um, Raymond Cano, who's a great 20th century French writer, called French the Latin of the 20th century, because it is so locked in, you know. So that's, that's really how, but you can also can't forget now, when I go to these plays, if you look at Corneille's play and look at my play, I would say that Corneille represents 35% of what's on the page, you know, and not even that, not even literally, because what I, what I find in, in, in translapping these plays is this, and I discovered it very early on, that only playwrights should translate plays because the first job of translating a play is actually not translating the language. Believe it or not, even though a play is made of words, the words are the least important part of a play. I know that sounds like a paradox, and it is. Here's why. Because when you are translating a play, it is not what you are translating is the current of emotion that is running underneath it. And what you need to do is you need to think as a playwright. You need to think, what was Corneille trying to get off his chest? What are these characters about? Who are they? What do they run by? And when you know that, then you find a way into the character. It's not, and then the language will come of itself because then you allow the character to produce the language, not you. And here's an example. You know, you, a character in French says, we. Oui. Fine. You can write down yes and move on. But depending on who that character is in English, that character can say yes, yeah, uh-huh, sure, right. The character cannot say anything and nod his head, depending on who that character is. And so that's why I say the work of that's why it takes three months to think about these plays, because I am thinking about what is happening underneath the play. When you, when you translate what's going on underneath it, the language will then suit that. It's not like you translate, it's not like a one-to-one -one correspondence, because then you get those professorial translations in which people are speaking academies, which is the death of theater. And so I, I, what I am doing with these plays is making a play suggested by that plot and those characters and running with it. And so I don't need to translate word for word because that's not what I'm doing, you know. No, but I think the, the challenge is it's more in the verse because with the Richard Rover translations of Moliere, yeah. there, there, I mean, you, you, a Richard Rover translation and anything else is night and day. It's not, it's not even like Moliere when anyone else does it. But he's a poet, so he's, you know, yes. the first is kind of what he does, and it's amazing to me that you were able to get to capture the verse and the rhythm, because that's what makes the... the but Richard Wilbur and I, in a funny way, are exact opposites, you know. He, he was a great translator, and when you read his Moliere, you are reading what basically what Moliere wrote, but that's just not what I do. And so, anyway, we will. We should probably wrap. We shall wrap. Last question over here. One more. Folks that like interacting with Mark Twain. <laughs> you know, he was a son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he was really the cigars. You know, the white suit, the pretension. It's really terrible. And he wanted, he wanted more money. It was, it was really bad. It was fun. That, that shows. Fun.
Thank you all for coming.